Home Show Garden Pros, helping to turn your thumb green. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the live version of Home Show Garden Pros. This is uh, where we do a little bit of a uh, video version of our radio show. So the radio show, Home Show Garden Pros, is every single Saturday, 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. on 610 Sports Radio. So Saturday mornings, 7 to 9. Tune in then. If you don't want to tune in then, which, you know, I don't know why you wouldn't. It's like a great way to get your day going. We talk gardening, then you garden. It's perfect. But if you don't want to, let's say you're a sleepyhead or you're busy, um, you can go to our home show, gardenpros.com website, and there's the listen button there. Click on that. Also on that button, you have a bunch of great videos from our awesome co-op members. You have the Ask a Pro button, a, a great way to get your question answered. Um, you'll send an email to me. I'll answer it. The, all the questions we're going to lift up today are from that same spot. Do you want to tell you about our awesome co-op members? We just have this group of phenomenal retail garden centers that have just such a such done an incredible job of kind of organizing their space, training their staff so that when you show up, you get the best possible experience you can get. Beautiful plants, great layout, knowledgeable staff. So you got um, Plants for All Seasons on 249 just past the Weta. You've got Nature's Way Resources up 49, just past the Woodlands before Conroe. It's right off 49, great place to go there. In Kingwood, there's Kingwood Garden Center and also Warren Southern Gardens, two great spots in Kingwood, both co-op members, pretty awesome stuff. And then in Katy, out there right in the middle of Katy, really Katy's go-to garden shop is Nelson Nursery and Water Gardens, such a great place. And then down south, southwest, there is Enchanted Forest and Enchanted Gardens, two really cool places to shop. All of them beautiful beautiful spots, great advice. Uh, great plants, great advice. What more do you need to garden? That, you know, nothing. You don't need anything else to garden. So uh, this is one of the uh, solo shows we like to do, kind of give our uh, our rotation of guests a little bit of a break. And so we, uh, we like answering questions on here. That's what we do. My job is to help you be a better gardener. So I do that by answering kind of general questions that maybe can help people out. Uh, maybe there's one point in there that'll help you kind of see something you didn't see before. But if you have a specific question, we got the comment box. Just put it right in there, and we'll we'll answer it. We're so happy to answer it. We love when they come in, and uh, that is that is what we do. So we're going to jump into our email questions. We have four of those, and uh, oh, they're, they're very good questions. So here we go. Question one. It's from Michael. Michael says, I'm building a raised bed to plant some herbs and vegetables. He wants both, herbs and vegetables. What do you suggest for soil? Should I do a combination of peat moss and black leaf mulch in the bottom? That's super specific. You know, it's like most people are like, what do you suggest for soil? And then they wait. But no, he's like, got a thing. Peat moss and black leaf mulch in the bottom, all mixed together, then compost on top. Also, should there be a layer of bull rock on the bottom to encourage drainage? So I followed up with Michael on this, and that bed is three feet deep. And so when it comes down to it, the river walk, river rock or bull rock is a great thing to do. Instead of peat moss, though, for the middle area, you want something that drains a lot better. So something they mixed in with expanded shale. Peat moss is pretty known for holding a lot of water, and you really want that to drain through. Now, Michael, I love the idea of compost on top. So if you made four inches of compost on top, and then it a pretty good garden mix, something like the Garden Light from Nature's Way Resources or uh, the Black Magic, um, I mean, Gardener's Magic from Landscaper's Pride. Those are two great soils to fill up space. And then you top it off with some good uh, good compost. That Nature's Way compost is really phenomenal. So that's what I would do on a deep, deep bed like that. I like the idea of the three layers, and I really like the idea of doing a drainage, handling drainage off the bat. Now, we don't need a huge amount of drainage. You know, you can... You can grow vegetables pretty much in the soil if you build it up two, three inches. So if you can imagine that we don't want water racing through, um, and so don't make that bull rock layer like you know half the bed. Make it six inches max. And bull rock are the big four-inch rocks, but I like the river rocks. They're one to two inches. That generally you have a better kind of flow through, or maybe one to three inches. You get better flow through, but it also um, isn't quite as fast, isn't laser jet waterfall fast. You know what I'm talking about, laser jet waterfall. It's like everybody knows how fast those are. They're so fast. All right, question number two. Well, I will say this about question number one, though. The um, 
we see a lot of new gardeners and they get plants, they put them in the ground. I, in fact, I went to a farm recently in this same situation and the plants sort of freeze. And so that is, that's an issue of not using quality soil. And so you may look at a bag of soil or a couple yards of soil and maybe like, wow, that's expensive. But buying cheap soil doesn't work. Like literally that is money that just you're spending on nothing at all. It's like, you can buy nice, expensive soil, and it's not expensive. I'll just say that. It only seems expensive because it's more expensive than total garbage. So um, instead of just ripping your money into small bits and, like, putting it in the trash compactor, buy good soil. And that's why we lift up La Landscaper's Pride and Nature's Way Resources all the time because they'll actually grow your vegetables. It, it really is a matter of success and not success, of getting a crop of vegetables or not. So when it comes down, you know, to your choice, choose, choose the soil that people are like, yes, this grows my vegetables really, really well. So that's the end of question one. I feel like that was, you know, a really strong ending to that, that ending there. So, all right, question number two here. Okay, this is from Jay Jayita. Great, uh, great name, Jayita. Here we go. I have an extended area with zinnias along with a hibiscus and a rangoon creeper. Hmm. Looking to add another plant to that lot. Any suggestions, please? They would all need the same kind of water. Hopefully the uh, two hydrogens, one oxygen kind of water. That's what we're no, she probably means watering rate. Are dwarf sunflowers a good option? I'm going to say no. Uh, dwarf sunflowers are a prairie plant. Um, all those rudbeckias are really native prairie, and they like well-draining, fast-draining soil spaces. What you've described here um, is really kind of something that's going to like irrigation. It's going to like a lot of water. And so when that, when I kind of think about that, maybe I'm thinking like um, natal plum, the nom noms, uh, that little very steady plant. And I guess you're looking, they have a really pretty bright fruit on them and nice white flowers. Another one that likes a little bit of wetness is a cool one. Um, it's called groomy chama. Um, it's spelled just like it sounds. Groomy chama. And it's another shrub, makes little berries. They're very tasty, like smoky cherry grapes. And it gets covered with pretty white flowers, too. I'm trying to think of other wet-loving plants. If you're looking for some kind of low-ish, that might be a great time to do Australian violets. Um, if you have a little bit of shade, that generally loves a little bit of wet, too. So hopefully those are some good options for you. Um, but yeah, those, those plants you mentioned are all kind of water-loving plants. You know, they don't want to pool. They don't want to puddle but they also don't want it to be bone dry. And it is really smart of you, Jay, to, to say, I want plants that all kind of fit, that all kind of need to be watered together. She must be an experienced gardener. So I think that's cool. That's cool. Nice work. Oh, uh, 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 there's a couple of shrub jasmines that are cool too. I checked those out. Carnation of India is a beautiful one too. That one smells so good. So we've given you some options. If you want to recap, just, you know, rewind. It's, uh, it's a great thing about video, right? I know. So cool. All right, next question. Here we go. Mark is like the uh, question guy. And so he's like, I'm like, next question. All right, here we go. This is from David. Could you recommend a good herbicide for G Virginia buttonweed in St. Augustine? Thank you. No, thank you, David. Okay, real quick. Weeds in your lawn. I don't like them. I'm not a fan of them. Um, I welcome the energy to get rid of them. They do, however, teach us something. Right, Every weed that you've got tells you a story of what's going on in your soil. And that's always where the real problem is. So Virginia buttonweed, not the real problem, right? It's kind of a symptom of the problem. And yes, it's an annoying symptom that we want to get rid of, but the problem is generally localized compaction. And so what's happening, Virginia buttonweed loves water. And so if you have localized compaction, you've got little bowls in your soil. So very flat, maybe even like saucers, if you will. Um, in your soil and it's storing water there and so as the rain comes your sprinkler goes off that area stays a little a wetter a little longer and so that's just that's a sign that you've got that problem and so one thing that leads to is very shallow roots on all your plants that are growing in that space and anytime you have a shallow root area weeds are going to be an issue right your St. Augustine roots like to go pretty deep um, in nature, they've been found to go eight feet deep. Now, you're probably not going to get that in your clay soil, but a foot, two feet, that would not be unreasonable. And so, but if your soil and your water is all, be kept, is all being kept at two inches, well, you're going to have weeds and you're going to have water-loving weeds. 
um, dollar wheat, Virginia buttonweed, um, sometimes nutsedge. These are all like plants that like a, a wet setting. And so compost top dressing, Microlife Humates Plus, these are really great solutions to loosen up the soil, open up the soil and let it drain, reduce the compaction problem. Once you've done that, then get that herbicide. And in this case, it's easy to handle Virginia buttonweed with Agrilon. But once you've done that, you can come in with the Agrilon, kill the Virginia buttonweed and be like, okay, problem is now solved. Those Virginia buttonweed seeds are going to sink down too, too deep to germinate because the soil is nice and open and the St. Augustine roots are going to go deeper and your St. Augustine is just going to outcompete anything that wants to come up. And so there's the whole solution. So Agrilon, but after a compost top dressing. Thanks a lot for that great question. Here we go. Question number four. We're going too fast. Are we going too fast? We're going a little too fast, maybe. I'm getting a little. So what we need when we're going too fast is for you to ask me a question. You just put it in the comments, um, preferably about gardening, um, not, you know, other other things I'm not an expert on. So that's harder. But, you know, whatever, you know, if you're Astro's questions, you know, are we going to re-sign Correa? I don't want to talk about it. I'm sad. I think we're not going to. You didn't ask, but I I mean, hey, we're on Sports Radio 610. I got to have an opinion sometimes. Okay, here we go. Question number four. This is from Allie. My peach tree has ants all over it. When I looked closer, I saw ants going into a hole in the trunk. See picture. Should I be worried about this? Let's see that picture. Okay, there it is. So I did ask Allie if she could send me... Um, try to get a picture or two of the ants themselves because depending on the type of ant, that's where we either have a problem or we don't have a problem. That's where we, you know, know the tree is going to be okay or like need to take immediate action on it. So there are carpenter ants, there are termites that look like kind of like ants. Um, it's fire ants, then it's probably just a home and that hole probably goes all the way down to the soil. I um, mean, that's not too big of a deal if it's fire ants, uh, if, if it's um, crazy ants. Cranberry ants. Is that what they're called? That's the other name for them? Anyway, um, crazy ants. They're the little bitty red ones. They move really, really fast. And, you know, if, if it's them, it's probably not an issue. But if it's carpenter ants or if it's termites, then it's definitely an issue. So when it comes down to it, what you can do is you can pour some molasses down in that hole. That is probably the first thing I would do. No, no bugs like molasses. Anytime your plant gets covered with or sprayed with or doused with or drenched with molasses, the bugs kind of take off. Um, it's kind of, they don't like to smell and then they don't, they can't digest those sugars, especially caterpillars. And so that's one thing that you can do is just kind of pour some water down horticultural molasses into that hole. You can get it at any of our co-op member locations, or you can get it at a feed store, places like that. Friendswood Hardware is a great place to get it. If you're down Southeast of Houston, Southwest Fertilizer, if you're in town, another good spot. So, and just pour it in there. So you don't have to like wait till it fills up. You just want to pour a few ounces in, six, something like that. And that will stymie uh, anything. Termites especially hate molasses, and that's a good thing to do. They also don't like water. And so if you pour it in there, you'll get a nest probably come up at the base, and you'll get to see what kind of ants you've got or, or insect you've got. So let's hope it's not termites. If it is termites, then the tree is just toast. You can get it out of your yard so that it doesn't infect other trees, raised beds, your house. Things like that that you like, you know, your wooden pony, um, all the stuff that you might not want to be destroyed. So, um, you know, that's that's our four questions. That's that's zooming through there, Mark. We really that was quick advice. I'm sure lots of people are coming on with their questions now um, because they they are they didn't get enough information from the four. If they don't ask a question, that means they love the information. So that we know. Oh, Mark's sister-in-law has a question about aphids. Can Mark, can we hear you? Is that? My sister-in-law, Lauren. She, uh, Lauren. She was, uh, this is an, uh, an issue that they're having in New Orleans. They live in New Orleans. Okay. My brother. But uh, they had an aphid uh, infest infestation. At okay. Time. And uh, she, cho she showed me a picture of a little white, little white bug scurrying across a, a piece of purple, purple lawn chair. Okay. Said, what do I do about these? So I said, let me ask Dan. Well, if they are aphids, we see aphids especially in times of stress on plants. So the winter freeze was one. 
the spring I think has been kind of stressful, um, hot and cool and hot and cool. Summer will be one. Any other natural event, human events like um, a chemical spill. Uh, my my daughter one time did a paint project out in the lawn, and that was a stress event for that part of the lawn. And so that's where we see those stress events. So anytime stress goes up, there's a rating for the nutrition in the plant called bricks, and that bricks goes down. Well, pest bugs only like plants that have a low bricks. We, on the other hand, really love plants that have a high bricks. So they've got a mealy bug. They have a mealy bug. Same, same similar group. So these sucking insects like scale, mealy bug, um, there's other ones, but aphids are on there. They are also, they like the low bricks. They like an unhealthy plant, but also they're kind of like food for lots of predator bugs. So this is where you can, you can kind of leave a small population, like one crawling across your chair, alone and ladybugs will show up there's a type of lady beetle or it's a similar beetle and it's called a mealybug destroyer i mean what do you think that does you know what i mean like it's not a clever name it's just straightforward mealybug destroyer they destroy mealybugs it's like the name and so if you can uh, you know kind of tolerate some aphids a lot of times you'll see those predators come in you can also release ladybugs they're pretty generalistic predators they they will definitely eat aphids so if you have an aphid problem, say on your corn or your collard greens or your kale, something like that, th those are pretty common this time of year. Release releasing ladybugs is great. Now what you want to do is you want to buy them, get them in the fridge, and release them in the very morning. Make sure there's some water, right? Because they may leave your space because they're they're thirsty, and they, you know, some of them will stay. If you can get them to sprinkle out on the plant that you actually want to protect, that's a good thing to do. But you really, you don't want to get home straight from the store, open them up, they'll all just fly away. And you'll be like, oh, well, that was that was cool. That was a pretty show of bugs flying away from my plants that are getting destroyed by aphids. Another thing to do with scale, ladybugs, mealybugs, is get a little bit of a high-pressure spray and just hose them off your plants. That works really great with scale. Um, they're very sensitive bugs under that shell. And so... And this is another one where molasses is your best friend. Horticultural molasses is a great thing to get in your hose and sprayer and just spray the top and the bottom of all the leaves. And that will stymie whitefly, aphids, things like that pretty pretty readily. So hope that helps your uh, sister-in-law out. I think it will. They're, uh, they tend to their garden pretty well, so I think it'll be good advice. They'll, they'll, I think they'll take care of it. All right. Who dat gonna kill them bugs? Am I right? Who dat? You are right. <laughs> okay, so that's um, that's how they cheer for the Saints sometimes in New Orleans. Who dat? Or Nola. Uh, there's a question from Tim Johnson over here. Oh, we have a question from Tim Johnson over here. I um, I don't have it. I'm going to lean forward a little bit here and here. look at it. Uh, I, I can he, read it. He asks, our bottle brush trees are coming back. What fertilizer do you recommend to expedite? Okay. Well, uh, ooh, expedite. Nice word there, Tim. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Um, so that means go faster. You know, make make uh, make it happen quicker. Um, and in this situation, you got trees coming back. I would use the MicroLife Citrus uh, fertilizer. It is made for fruit trees, but it also has a a bit of a mineral pack in it that's kind of um, a little bit higher than some of the other MicroLifes. They do such a great job because they get in the soil, they improve the soil, and they feed the roots that way. But this one with those minerals, maybe some minerals that were lost in the death of the tree that had to overcome a lot of kind of stress there, that might be the best thing to do. So it's an orange bag. It's called MicroLife Citrus. I think it's called Citrus and Fruit Tree. So really great product. Really, really great product. And as we mentioned kind of the beginning of the show with our first question, the soil matters so much. So you using good soil for your beds, for your veggie beds, your fruit trees, is going to make a difference in the produce, how much you get, how good it tastes, how big they are. And so we have Sherry Hara here with a little video to kind of describe the difference between compost and mulch. And we'll explore that a little bit after the video. So over to you, Sherry. Sherry and I love talking soils. It's something that we care the most about. When it comes to figuring out solutions to plant health, we always kind of go back to the soil. Right. Sherry brought a great example of mulch to compost. What exactly do we have here? So here we have a very coarse I ground mulch. I can see the chunks, big chunks, less fine things. Right, still a really good product, but chunky. And here is a more finely ground 
definitely. Mulch. Probably more aged too, right? More aged, and you can see the darker color from the aging process. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then we get into more compost, so. So different compost from different kind of makers. Yes, cool. absolutely. And you can kind of see the progression of the color. So this one's probably aged maybe a year or so. Yeah. And then these two right here are aged a little bit longer, this one being two years. And you know that really because of the color. Right. Because that the, color represents kind of some of the acids that are released, mostly humic acid. Right, and which is acid. great for Both of them are great for soil life. Yeah, and that's what gives it that dark color. So when you're, when you're looking at compost, you want something dark and rich. Yeah, definitely. So what would you, this one is the darkest and seems to be the most broken down. What would right. you use it for? Um, I use this to top dress my lawn with. I use it anytime I replant my flower beds, um, but it's it is great for that lawn purpose because there's no big chunks in it. That's awesome. And that puts all the good nutrients and microbes back in the soil. Cascades down to the soil level. Absolutely. They make a little bit bigger version of this that can be a really great mulch in repla in replacement of black mulch. Right. Because it is so dark. It's a little got it's got a little more body to it, um, bigger pieces, but it has that dark color still. That's so awesome. So for the black mulch users, which is a big no no you could get away with using uh, a compost, an aged compost as a mulch. That's awesome. And so compost is a great way to top off your lawn. I use them all the time in my veggie beds. I pretty much plant in straight compost and let it become soil. Right. The two interact. Well, this is cool. What a, what a cool thing to see this transition. Now, what would you use this mulch for? Um, I would mulch my beds with it. Um, after I replant stuff, but it won't stick around as long as something that is a little bit more coarse. So if you like the look of mulch to stick around, then I would go with something a little more, more coarse like this. Awesome. Yep. Well, that's great. Thanks so much. Thanks. For more on soils and mulches, go to homeshowgardenpros.com. Sherry, she just always gives such great advice. It's really just super knowledgeable. Plants for All Seasons up there, 249, just best Loretta. Definitely worth a visit. She's just so smart. So there's a really cool opportunity coming up. Um, if you know anybody that speaks Spanish, uh, Spanish gardeners, you know, the city is has 40%, something like that, Spanish speakers. And so OBA, the Organic Horticulture Benefits Alliance, is putting on a class, a three-class seminar. And there it is on the screen, the uh, Landscaping with the esper Experts, just covering kind of general organic approaches, how to improve the soil from the soil's perspective, veggie gardening, and also landscaping with natives. So this this is all going to be in Spanish. Um, and so if you know anybody that you think would be interested, go to the OBA Facebook page or the OBA website, obaonline.org, and, you know, check out, check it out. There's a, a Spanish language flyer there too. I speak English, and so I know a lot of our listeners, watchers, um, you know, uh, consumers of the great advice that Home Show Garden Pro puts out speak English, but this is a great opportunity. Anyone you know that speaks Spanish, this is going to be a wonderful webinar. So, yeah. So this was this was it. Our Facebook Live. Check out our co-op members. Check out our website, homeshowgardenpros.com. Like, follow, click, um, smiley face, heart, anything that you can do to our social media. We love that. I love answering questions, Facebook questions, email questions. One last time, that website, homeshowgardenpros.com. Tune in this Saturday, 7 a.m. Going to be a lot of fun answering a lot of questions. All right, get out there and garden.